I'm going to be reading a story called, uh, or creative nonfiction called Of His Oranges. My grandfather's heart was an orange, so full of the tang of life that it would burst out of him in tears, in revolutionary fist poundings, in off key arias and shuffled feet dances. It would boom out in great puff cheek, mmm pa, mmm pas, his impression of a tuba that earned him my explosive giggle and a lifelong nickname of Umba. It would cocoon me in a soft croon as I lay nestled in his lap with sleep-heavy butterfly eyelids, lulled by his rendition of Sleepy Town Gal and the steady metronome of his heartbeat. Later in life, it would erupt out of him during dreamy midnight wrestling matches with his past. My grandfather would yell, sob, and punch the wall of his bedroom, a sleep-induced surrogate for the apparitions of his family members and former foes. I got used to hearing the sounds of these scuffles, learned to tune them out like ambulance sirens or the police helicopters that patrolled my neighborhood. From an early age, I became intimately familiar with the haunting power of memory. When I think about my grandfather, I think about the softball heft of an orange in the bottom of my Christmas stocking, a, tra a tradition honoring a time in my family history when alchemical poverty turned a single piece of fruit into treasure. I think about golden elixirs and little juice glasses with toasts to being healthy, wealthy, and wise. We called it freshly squozen and chased it down with hot buttered bagels. Mm -hmm. I think about the rounded mass inside a crumpled lunch bag with my name scrawled across the front in bright colors. I think about my grandfather standing over our kitchen sink, greedily consuming oranges by the bagful, the juice sticking to his beard, running down his arms his eyes glittering with a childlike gluttony, his face made young again. There's a picture of my grandfather and me taken a while before my grandmother's death and before my parents and I moved in with him. In the photo, an old man wearing thick black-rimmed glasses holds the tiny hand of a tiny curly-maned girl as she stands on the middle rung of a ladder. Both are wearing floppy, faded blue fisherman's hats. Both wear a vaguely serious expression as they face the camera directly and squint into the sunlight. What the camera doesn't capture is the old man assisting the little girl in her daring leap onto the trampoline waiting below, and the look of pride and satisfaction that erupts across both their faces at the completion of their circus trick. It doesn't capture the two of them facing each other, grabbing each other's hands, and bending in ceremonial unison toward one another a bow, a nod, a firm handshake, and a clicking of heels, like two mutton-chopped Habsburg ambassadors. <laughs> I still judge a man by the strength and finesse of his handshake. Dinners in the house where I lived with my parents and grandfather were rowdy affairs, voices escalating to be heard amidst the din of art history quizzing, literary quoting, and opinionated politicking. My grandfather, as our resident wise man, would mediate. His voice would rise above us all, and then suddenly, if the conversation got too political, he'd get quiet, look around nervously, and put a finger to his lips. Shh, he'd whisper, half in jest, but with an edge of severity. The government might hear you. Mm -hmm. A paranoia carried over from his communist labor organizing youth in the McCarthy era. This paranoia and a deep sadness sometimes crept up on him overwhelmed him. Tragedies in the news would fell him. When the anniversary of my grandmother's death came around, he could hardly bear to get out of bed. Fatalism would fall from his lips, comments about death or the irreparable state of the world. My mother would call these his Eeyore days, his gloomy gray cloud days. These days burned into him like an ex with an exposed cuticle sharpness. I did my little girl best to cheer him up. Usually it seemed to help ease the sting. Mornings were our time. When I was young, they began with breakfast. The two of us sitting across the table, the smell of citrus and toaster oven crumbs surrounding us. As I got older and lazier and school started earlier, breakfast time became reserved for weekends, joined by my parents in the New York Times. 
still from elementary school through high school until his eyes became too milky with cataracts. My grandfather would drive me to school every day. We talked about what I was learning, about books, about art, about history and our family history. Or he would just listen to me, giving me his most patient family therapist attention. He'd weigh in on my adolescent dilemmas like they were matters of state. Sessions ended upon my, our arrival to school with a quick kiss on the cheek and a slamming of the car door. The orange in the bottom of my backpack was a reminder of his advice throughout the day. When my grandfather ate oranges, he cut them into sections, scraped out the flesh with his teeth, and sucked the rind dry with the insatiable hunger of a vegetarian vampire. <laughs> He would eat one after another until all that was left was a pile of desiccated pulpy sponges. His appetite was endless. I prefer to remember my grandfather that way, surrounded by the refuse of his ravenous citrus feasting. I'd rather remember him caked in sticky orange sweetness than how I saw him last, thin and delicate in a hospital bed force-fed through a tube in his nose because his throat refused to perform the familiar act of swallowing. I'd rather remember his voice soaring above us all, his emphatic fist banging against the table, not the wordless open and close of his mucus-filled mouth, the pitiful pucker of a fish out of water. I'd rather not remember how sad his eyes looked, how hard he tried to comfort me, through a kind of glimmering optical semaphore. I'd rather not remember how lonely and hollow my one-sided conversation sounded next to the beep of medical machines. I don't like to think how light and insubstantial his hand felt, a mannequin limb reproduction of its former strength and surety. Or how when my mask of a smile split and dissembled at the seams, and the antiseptic smell of healing and death hung heavy at the back of my tongue. I surrendered to my cowardice and retreated. When I eat an orange, I take my time. I puncture the rind with a fingernail and dig in, dusting the air with scent. I savor the sweet, slight, slightly acrid release from the skin as I peel it bit by bit delicately and tenderly flaying the fruit. Once naked, I separated segments, and I study them. There's such a fragile beauty in the flesh of an orange. A thin membrane is the only thing that makes it solid, encasing the juice like a chrysalis. It's a stained glass window, trapping the sun's light and warmth inside. I luxuriate in the first bite, relishing the sensation of the burst of juice in my mouth. I tongue the taste out of it, immerse myself in its sweetness, as well as its bitter, canker sore sting. I abandon myself completely to the flavor of memory. When I eat an orange, I commune with the dead. I split it down the middle, dividing it between my grandfather and me. With each bite, I swallow the past, feeling it seep into my bones, letting it nourish and sustain me, all the while imagining the conversations the two of us might have had over this shared piece of fruit. Thank you.